Hello, this is the Veterinary Surgery Podcast. If you are a veterinary healthcare team member and you like surgery, this is the podcast to follow. Please subscribe and enjoy the show. Hello, this is Dr. Jolle Kerpenstein, and this is the Vet Surgery Podcast number three. Super thrilled to be here, not only on the podcast, but also in New York City, where I've been the last couple of days uh, because of Westminster. This is going to be an exciting podcast. We have an interview uh, with the amazing Dr. Joe Canarni. And why are we interviewing him? Because he is a Westminster show best of show winner and uh, he's a veterinarian uh, from uh, North Carolina and we have a a little bit of an interview about uh, what Westminster is all about and I'm here um, because of Westminster Um, it is one of the biggest dog shows in the US Uh, we just went through a very thrilling final where the poodle won Uh, it's a standard poodle majestic animal and uh, obviously as a veterinarian I look at these shows uh, with scrutiny and you should um, because we need to, you know, we need to see if those animals are healthy. And, and Joe and I will be talking about that a little bit. So it's a very, very exciting uh, episode, I think. The other thing we're going to talk about: new cancer screening test. Uh, I will discuss a article that uh, caught my eye, which is a transdiaphragmatic gastrotomy for the extraction of distal esophageal foreign bodies in uh, 13 dogs. I thought that was really cool. And then once again, I think that uh, I'll spend a little bit of time to talk about the 2020 AAFP feline retrovirus testing and management guidelines, just to give you a little overview of what's happening there. In the uh, January 2020 uh, veneer practice news, um, they're talking about a cat virus that could be linked to phenol feline cancer and that's obviously really interesting so there's uh, Australian researchers that have discovered that these this feline virus might be the cause of liver cancer in cats and it was identified in 2018 by the University of Sydney um, Julia Beatty uh, and um, with a whole group of other people uh, looked at this and uh, they found out that there is a virus called cat hepatna virus dch um, and they found them in hepatitis and certain liver cancer in cats and this might be the cause of the disease so obviously they don't know for sure yet but it is a pretty common uh, virus in the cat um, and they mentioned numbers of 6.5% in the Australian uh, cat population and 10.8% uh, in the Italian cat population. But that doesn't mean, of course, that uh, we need to uh, sound the alarm for every cat that has this virus. Um, but it is interesting that uh, Dr. Beattie says that uh, one you being infected doesn't mean that you will develop uh, cancer and two uh, cats cannot give the disease to humans so uh, it's important to know that uh, but she adds it is similar to hepatitis b and hepatitis b is of course a big uh, concern in people because it can cause uh, chronic hepatitis and chronic hepatitis is, is once again uh, associated with um, liver tumors so that is quite interesting and this was uh, published in viruses which is a big journal virology journal. the other thing I would like to point out is that the journal feline medicine and surgery has just published in January uh, the uh, new guidelines of feline retrovirus virus testing and management so I talked about it in my last podcast a little bit and I think it's an amazing thing uh, Dr. Little, Dr. Levy, Hartman, Hoffman, Lehman, Hosey, Ola, and Dr. St. Denis worked on this article. And um, and really what they're saying is that they did this work in 2008 with the AFP, the and American, um, American Association for Feline Practitioners, and, and it was high time to, uh, to revamp it. And uh, their uh, interpretation really is that, uh, you know, although there might be vaccines available for feline leukemia and for FIF in some countries, uh, it's really important to identify 
um, infected cats. So cats should be tested as soon as possible after they acquired, either following exposure to an infected cat or a cat of an in unknown infection status prior to vaccination against these uh, diseases or whenever critical illness occurs. And there's still a paucity of data evaluating treatments in these cats. But it's a really cool article. Uh, it is in the uh, new journal Feline Medicine and Surgery Clinical Practice. So that's a journal that is freely available for everybody. And I would definitely suggest everybody to, uh, to read it. Uh, it has some really cool pictures. And the one thing that I thought was interesting is that uh, feline leukemia, depending on the immune system, uh, it will affect the uh, prognosis of the cat. So definitely something uh, to read. Nothing to do with surgery, but I thought it was really cool. So, so there. The other thing I wanted to mention was that it is uh, National uh, Dental Month here in the US. And AHA, the American Hospital Association, has some really cool um, things that you can use for this. Um, and obviously, AHA uh, is a great resource uh, to help educate your clients about uh, dental health. Um, and so there are some uh, some things that you can download from the web page. Uh, Pet needs anesthesia for routine dental care. We all know that. We definitely are not in favor of doing this without, uh, uh, without anesthesia. Um, there is a flyer that talks about uh, the pet's dental care in general. Um, healthy mouth healthy pet why dental care matters and a flyer that talks about dental anesthesia um, and last but not least the aha dental care guidelines for dogs and cats were published in 2019 so that is really cool um, and there's lots of instru instructions there so go to aha.org forward slash dentistry so aha.org forward slash dentistry Cool. So that's uh, two things from the AHA journal uh, and uh, I would like to have a little break now because uh, I'm going to set here the interview with uh, Joe Canarni. So here we go. Hello, this is Dr. Jolle Kerpenstein. I have a special guest with me. This is the Veneer Surgery Podcast. And uh, Joe, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Joe Canarni, a veterinarian from Reedsville, North Carolina, currently here in New York City with the great doctor. And what are we doing in New York? We were attending the Westminster Dog Show. And you have a quite a history here as a, uh, a dog owner that won. Yes, so I was fortunate, um, thrilled, excited to go best in show in 1995 with a black Scottish terrier named Peggy Sue or Champion Gale Force Postscript. Perfect timing. I'll cut it out. Don't mm. worry. Um, so uh, in 95, you won this Westminster Dog Show. And that's quite a big deal eh, as a uh, as a breeder to uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, it was it. You know, my life changed. Yeah. Um, we did not expect to go best. We were the number one terrier. We expected hopefully to win the group. Um, and we did. And then obviously that night we went on for best and um, just exciting um you know tv shows radio shows newspapers magazines um you know i was in europe speaking on behalf of avma and i was introduced as the guy that went best in show at westminster and i'm thinking yeah. oh my lord but uh, just just a, a incredible journey and that's amazing so we uh, we just were here the two days and uh, the poodle won uh, what do you think about the poodle stunning beautiful mm -hmm. uh, very well presented uh, moved really wonderfully and then you know at the end it was the typical poodle just lavishing in the silver trophies and the accolades and just enjoying it and um, and so it was it was remarkable and it was quite amazing because the dog was so well behaved that you know they put all these shimmering things next to him and he just sat there and enjoyed the show it was uh, that was that was quite impressive i have to say yeah so the the other thing is uh, joe well you have a veneer practice in north carolina and you do quite a lot of surgery and this is a surgery podcast so i always have to ask the the people that i interview their most favorite surgery to do so my most favorite surgery is a successful a successful um 
dorsal decompressive laminectomy, hemilaminectomy. And, and, and I, I say successful mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I don't think there's any feeling of taking a dog that comes in paralyzed um, and owners in fear and it walks out of your hospital or close to it. And that the thrill in the, to see you know, a, a family member returned to the family is great. And it, it, I, I'm always surprised with the ones that where it does work because it doesn't always work bad, how quickly they can recover after you decompress them. That's one thing that I think is. And then the other thing I think is, is amazing how much stuff you can get out. Yeah. Sometimes. So, you know, we went in um, and if I can get them, I had a, if I can get them fast mm -hmm. and they still have deep pain, of course, yeah. and it's not prolonged um, and you go in and you get all the crap out. <laughs> Yes. Um, and and um, and seeing that, but the people that procrastinate about making a decision and they mm. put it off, and then you know the prognosis goes down. But the ones we get, you can get fast. It's just incredible. Yeah, I think it, I'm always surprised with the toothpaste consistency that comes out if you have one of those, uh, and then uh, the the stuff that you get out and how quickly then they recover. Uh, suddenly, a lot less painful. And uh, and then you know, obviously they, they they need to get some time to recover. But most of them they do it quite fast. So and do you have any tips for people? Because you're just I, I mean I'm just a general practitioner, but you are a general practitioner, but you also have a lot of experience in surgery. And so for people that are hesitant to do this kind of surgery, what kind of tips would you give them? Well, so for me. I have been a veterinarian for 40 years. Mm -hmm. When I moved to North Carolina, there was not a North Carolina State University Veterinary College. There were no specialists, um, there were no specialty hospitals, emergency clinics, um, and our closest was Athens, Georgia. Yeah. So you had to learn, if we didn't do it, um, either a lot of patients would die uh, or they'd be paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you go in and um, obviously practice, but I was fortunate to have mentors. Yeah. And the mentors that had experience and walked me through and were patient with me uh, made the biggest difference in the, my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of tips did they give you, for instance? Well, one is I sat beside them. Mm. You know, and it was more than like in, than in vet school. Um, and then, uh, you know, um, sometimes I get a little fast for my own good. Mm. So especially in a back surgery is being patient uh, being thorough, know where you are, know your landmarks, um, and, and go forward. I think it's a really important point. Uh, anatomy is so vital, so uh, having a good preparation with your anatomy and know where you go and where you shouldn't go uh, is, is quite important. Going back to Westminster, to the dog show, uh, what's the veterinary role here? So Cornell uh, veterinary specialists in the university now provide the uh, veterinary services and um, several things is they obviously oversee any emergencies, any sick dogs, um, any issues. Um, dogs leave here and, and go um, in other places in the world, mm. and if they can, some of them need health papers. Uh, you know, one of the things about Westminster that a lot of the that people don't know, and we in the dog will do, is it's a bench show, and that mm. means your dog has to stay at the benching area until a certain time and it's usually around three o'clock um, and then they can leave and so a lot of people want to leave early and if you get a vet certificate you can leave but they're pretty strict on on letting them out okay okay so and then i guess they're there for if there's accidents i can imagine if you put so many dogs in one and most of the dogs are amazingly well behaved but you only need one that gets a little incident and yeah. you have to buy and that's where i don't even remember mm -hmm. i don't think i've ever remember seeing it but Accidents happen everywhere, yeah, yeah. you know, and um, and you know something can go wrong. And and they also check the dogs, don't they? The veterinarians to see if the dogs are healthy. No. Oh, they don't. No, they the dog. The veterinarians that are here mm -hmm. are strictly for uh, emergency services, medical okay. services, uh, signing forms that they need to. Um, but you know, once the dog's in the ring, um, you know it, the judge kind of owns the ring. Okay, okay. So the, the the vet is not not like in horses that they when they do these these races that they have to go by the vet to see if they're still okay. Right. So if you look at a lot of the race horses, mm -hmm. they're examined by veterinarians yeah, beforehand. Yeah. Okay. Before they'll go in. Oh, that's something I learned then uh, today. So, uh, uh, so the veterinarians. Uh, so do you think there's a, a should there be a role for vets to check them? Well, but you know, so I see a lot of show dogs. Yeah. 
so I see them and they're the on the road a lot so I they, they're kind of getting checked anyhow so you, you what you're saying is that these owners they're so dedicated and these dogs are so expensive that they will take them to the vet to be checked before yeah. they go yeah because if you look at the purebred breeder the, mm -hmm. the breeders of the dogs that were here you know they're doing you know um, OFA of hips they're mm -hmm. doing elbows they're doing eye surfs um, you know, in poodles, they'll do skin testing, they'll do PRAs. And so there's just, yeah. um, before I bred my dog, you know, we had a, any test that was available looking for genetic issues uh, or a issue, we did. And so when you see the purebred breeder that's here, because you, you saw the dogs perform, you oh, saw them amazing. run around the big ring. Amazing, yeah. If you don't breed a healthy athlete, mm. they can't do that. So their goal is I need to breed a healthy, sound dog um, and try to better the breed. And as a result, people that buy those dogs as pets come out with more than likely a healthy dog um, with some known genetics uh, predispositions. And with the, the big shows like Westminster, I think you get the best of the best. Eh? So these are not the first dog breeds that you come that you meet right, on so the street these are people that have years and years of experience in breeding and really want to do what's best for the uh, for the breed yeah so you know we were sitting there in the seats and the lady behind us was being interviewed and she mm -hmm. had been sitting in that seat for 50 years yeah um, we were a couple rows down i've been sitting in that seat for 30 years mm -hmm. uh, the friend of my barber has been sitting in that seat for 50 years yeah. so these are dedicated uh, um, dog lovers breeders that again the goal is to breed a really healthy talented sound yeah. dog um, and you have to know your genetics and you have to be careful what you do it's not just putting one and two together and see what three gets so one last question and this might be a question that's a little difficult to answer because there's also differences within breeds and within uh, countries so for instance in Europe some things are allowed and here they're not and vice versa um, do do these clubs communicate with each other because if I want a dog from Europe but he doesn't have dog tails dog to, uh, ear for instance can I still use him here in the US or is there is that it depends on the breed standard mm -hmm. so okay. um, you know as we know in Europe um, you can't have cropped ears mm -hmm. dog tails. so when when I um, I had raised schnauzers for a while and sold um, a dog to someone in England who and the dog actually went over and won schnauzers at Crufts, yeah. uh, which is biggie. And yeah. uh, so that we had to pick out the dog early and not do any of these things. Mm -hmm. um, if they okay, that's true, of right. course, because you can't crop them and then right. try to put them back. Yeah, right, so you true. can't put it back. So, you have, yeah. so when you're communicating, you make that decision ahead of time. Yeah. So in, in some of the breeds, it'll say um, there's a maybe, you know, um, so if you take schnauzers, that they can be either cropped or natural ears. Okay, um, so there, it's allowed to show natural ears. So you can them? show natural okay. ears. Okay. Uh, and again, I don't know all the breed standards, yeah, but course. some breed standards say either. Um, some say that um, one is preferred. Yeah. I can understand. Oh, this was really interesting. We're over our limit of time. I really appreciate it, Joe. And uh, thank you for sharing with us a little bit uh, the, the, the backstage of Westminster. I really enjoyed walking here. I think it's amazing. These breeds are so beautiful when you see them. And, uh, and the good thing about Westminster is you, could, you can kind of go to the back and see them being groomed up uh, for the big show. And I think that, once again, the poodle that won had just an amazing dog, so well-behaved, beautiful stride and a really a nice winner so great to be here and thank you Joe once again my pleasure all right that was an amazing interview I really love the guy and uh, we got so much information from him so I would like to finish with uh, two more things uh, one uh, we already talked a little bit about uh, um, the liver cancer virus or the liver the can liver cancer in cats with virus uh, aha also published an article which i thought was really funny in their trends magazine um, about strep throat don't blame your dog and they're reporting that uh, the animal health diagnostic center at cornell university college of veterinary medicine uh, reported recently that strep throat infections in humans and dogs are caused by different strains of streptococcus so in humans, strep throat is caused by group A streptococcus, and in 
dogs it is by group G streptococcus and um, in previous studies they couldn't differentiate between the two and uh, as a result dogs were implicated in strep infections in humans but that's absolutely not true because it's a different strain so everybody that says that you can now debunk because it's not happening last but not least uh, i of course have a article uh, that i will discuss uh, which is transdiaphragmatic gastrotomy for the extraction of distal esophageal foreign bodies in 13 dogs and this is a retrospective study that was also published by the journal of the american animal hospital association so they get a lot of love for me this time and it's 13 dogs with a distal esophageal foreign body that was not amenable to uh, management through endoscopy and those dogs had a transdiaphragmatic gastrotomy so they went through the chest into the stomach and then removed the foreign body um, interesting tidbit is that uh, these foreign bodies were there in an average for 5.6 days that's crazy don't you think why would people wait so long for that all right so i'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how they did it because i think that's the interesting part of the surgery uh, there were three fish hooks and 10 animal bones so i can imagine where the animal bones it's sometimes difficult to take them out the fish hooks i'm not so sure about uh, you know uh, most of the time endos endoscopists can take those out uh, pretty easily so uh, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about pro prognosis so with these articles that it's always a setup for introduction materials and methods results and discussion but i'm going to mainly focus on the materials and methods just to explain what they did so they anesthetized the dogs obviously um, and then they did a left lateral thoracotomy uh, through either the eighth or the ninth intercostal space um, so it's left side, eighth or ninth intercostal space, depending on the, uh, the location of the foreign body they sat. But most of them were in the eighth, if I remember it well. Then they packed off the caudal left lung lobe and they moved it cranially with some uh, laparotomy sponges. They dissected the distal esophagus, uh, put two uh, quarter inch penrose drains, tubes around the esophagus and i'm not completely sure why they did it but they said they did that because of, it allows manipulation of the esophagus and the foreign body a rotation of the distal esophagus and observational of the esophageal circumference so i guess uh, that's what you need then they put two stay sutures in the diaphragm they made a linear incision in the central tendinous region and the stomach was located elevated through the diaphragmatic incision and then a six centimeter gastrotomy was made between the greater and the lesser curvature of the stomach about three centimeters away from the cardia and then one hand was in the chest and the other hand uh, after they removed all the gastric contents um, and with one hand the assistant manipulated the foreign body through the cardia through the esophagus in the cardia and then from the inside of the cardia a long curved cochar hemostat was placed through the gastrotomy incision and into the distal esophagus so through the cardia uh, and to retrieve the foreign body and then with a little bit of wiggling i guess they pulled it out and then the closure of the gastrotomy was uh, in two layers um, with uh, two or three metric oh, it's interesting that it's a metric um, pds and then the thoracic cavity was lavaged and they only had one dog where they had kind of a complication because they couldn't get it out and uh, they had to do a esophagotomy so an incision in the esophagus interesting is uh, that uh, in, uh, there were five out of 13 were west highland white dogs hmm. terriers so those them terriers um and then uh, they found out that everybody had esophagitis which is normal because those if you wait six days for these for what should be taken out you can imagine and then uh, the, the only dog that died was the one that they uh, cut into the esophagus he got uh, a uh, pyothorax and died one day post surgery so i think it's quite interesting the thing that i would 
what I wonder, and they discuss it a little bit in their discussion, but not that much, is why would you do a thoracotomy for this? And why wouldn't you just do a abdominal incision, go through the diaphragm, do exactly the same thing, uh, but then don't cut into the chest? Uh, and they discuss it because that was um, recently reported uh, by, let's look it up, this is number 13. And this is action right here. Artson Hernandez uh, Raggedly GR Surgical Extraction of Canine Esophageal Foreign Bodies Through a Gastronomy Approach in the Journal of Small Animal Practice. That makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, and uh, and those people did 12 and none of the dogs uh, died. Um, but and it's probably comparable with this dog uh, with this this article because you know the um, the one dog that died had a complication after the esophagotomy. Um, yeah, so that's uh, it's interesting. Um, they don't really explain very well uh, why they want to do a thoracotomy, except for the fact that they have a better view in the chest, I guess. So, um, yeah. But I do, do agree that the, the, one of the conclusions that they had was it's much easier to do a gastrotomy than a esophagotomy. And so, um, cool article. So thank you, Dr. Deligianni. Deligianni. And this is from, uh, it looks like, from uh, Greece. Yes, so the article Thessaloniki. So uh, nicely done. Okay, I want to finish this podcast with uh, my favorite thing to do, and that's a Google search. So I typed in the the word suture this time, and suture, uh, I got 33 million results in 0.5 seconds. Uh, and a suture is the definition is a stitch or a row of stitches holding together the edges of a wound or surgical incision. And the second one is immovable junction between two bones, such as those of a skull. So skull suture, that's kind of cool. So, um, and then immediately under that it says, uh, people also ask, what are the three types of suture? And the answer is, these types of sutures can all be used generally for soft tissue repair, including both cardiovascular and neurologic procedures. Nylon, a natural monofilament suture, polypropylene, a synthetic monofilament suture, silk a braided natural suture and then the fourth one is polyester so they ask for three types and you get four polyester okay i guess that was from april 2018. oh well don't believe everything what uh, in the internet says that's kind of the uh, the general uh, consensus here all right this was it for this time really appreciate that uh, dr kenani was on uh, this call uh, had a great time here in new york uh, thank everybody that made that possible and i uh, thank you for listening and if you like this podcast please give us a good review on any of your podcast um, for instance apple Podcasts or stitcher or wherever you are and uh, like us so we'll see you next week talk to you later